everyone, and welcome to the eighth edition of Inside Voices, a webinar series hosted by Minerva Project. As the name suggests, Inside Voices is a series of candid conversations with leaders from inside higher education. The discussion centers on the journey of transformation, an often bumpy set of challenges and triumphs that all innovative leaders must navigate. My name is Christine Lucer, and I'm the Senior Director for Solution Design at Minerva Project which means I help our partners build learning innovation strategies that reinvent the student experience. By training, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, and I'm committed to reshaping our education systems so that the way people teach is more aligned with the way that brains learn, and experiential learning is a huge part of this. Today, I'm delighted to host Kate Trimble from MIT and Capri LaRocca from Minerva Project. We're going to explore the opportunities and challenges of integrating experiential learning into university curricula which Capri and our colleague Ninon just codified into a white paper called Redefining Experiential Learning, How Universities Can Deliver an Integrated Curriculum. We'll have a particular focus on how MIT and Minerva Project have approached innovation and change management. The three of us will have a recorded conversation for the first part of the call. Then we'll turn off the recording and open up the floor for questions from all of you. I was peeking through the roster and I know we have a great group of innovative thinkers here. Please take a moment to introduce yourself in chat, including your name, organization, and city. Feel free to add any questions and comments in the chat during the conversation. I'll work them in. Our guests are Kate Trimble, Senior Associate Dean and Director of Experiential Learning at MIT, and Capri LaRocca, Director of Experiential Learning at Minerva Project. Kate works to connect MIT students to a variety of hands-on experiences that support their learning in the classroom. She plays a strategic role in guiding active learning throughout the institution. Capri works with Minerva Partners to design and integrate academic curricula into experiential learning programs. She's key to designing and developing unique student life experiences at Minerva Project's flagship partner, Minerva University, and now works with partners around the globe to do the same. She's also the co-author of the recent Minerva White Paper on integrating experiential learning. Thanks to you both. You are focused on experiential learning, but it's a big word. So I want all of us who I think are here because they're excited about the topic to at least have an overview so we're aligned on what that phrase means and why it's important. Kate, can you tell us what experiential learning means at MIT? Sure. Yeah, it's a little bit of a buzzword right now. I think experiential learning is sort of having a moment. Um, but I often hear it referred to as uh, experimental learning, which is not also wrong. So um, MIT's motto is, uh, is men's at manus, so it's mind and hand. And I would say that experiential learning really is the hand part of that equation. It's, it's deeply embedded in MIT's DNA, and it's expressed in lots of different ways and places. So um, at MIT, we have a really wide variety of different types of experiential learning, everything from entrepreneurship, public service, internships, global opportunities, maker spaces and design, undergraduate research. Some of those experiences are for pay, some are for credit, some are just for fun, and they happen kind of everywhere. They happen on campus, off campus, and around the world. Um, but I would say that there are five things that they all have in common. And the first is that they're experiential, right? They're active, hands-on problem solving. So it's not sitting quietly in a lecture hall or completing a piece set that has a right or wrong answer. Um, it's much messier than that because it happens in the very messy and complicated real world um, with real stakes that sharpen student learning and connections that endure beyond the experiences. So the real world can be a faculty lab on campus, it can be a startup in a garage somewhere in Texas, or it can be an NGO uh, halfway around the world. Um, the, the next component is that the work is really rigorous and connected to what students are studying in their classes here at MIT. Um, dosage matters, so our, what we call ELOs or experiential learning opportunities are really extended or intense engagements that provide enough time for the learning to stick and for students to make meaningful contributions. And then the last piece is that there's some structure to them. So students get supervision and feedback from experts, whether that's a faculty member, an alumni mentor, a community partner. Um, and there are formal and informal opportunities for students to reflect on their learning and for programs to measure that learning and the student impact. That is a really wonderful overview. And Capri, I know we also have a framework at Minerva Project. You and our colleague Ninon just wrote a white paper about this. 
uh, redefining experiential learning, how universities can deliver an integrated curriculum. There's some definitions and frameworks. Can you walk us through some of that and maybe contrast it to what Kate just shared? Sure. Yeah. So we define experiential learning a bit more narrowly than most um, as a way of teaching, which integrates academic content with lived experiences to enable a deeper comprehension of the concepts and skills. Um, so experiential learning challenges students to apply their skills in a variety of contexts, building upon the formal class instruction. And so uh, I pulled in a, a couple images from the white paper, actually. Um, so Megan's going to help me out here. Thank you, Megan. Um, and, you know, in the research that we did for the white paper, we found that there are five really common categories that uh, people use when they say experiential learning. I think uh, a, a challenge is that many people say experiential learning, but mean a variety of things. Um, this is what we found is, is the most common. Um, and also the distribution of, of how faculty are using this currently in their, um, in their classrooms. Um, so this is from a study um, by the Journal of E-Learning and Knowledge Society. Um, but we also, building upon just the categories, also uh, connect learning to a broader cycle of student experiences. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we, we think of learning as part of a, a broader student experience where uh, that is connected through the learning outcomes. So students are first exposed to a concept, they then get to explore it with their classmates, and then they exercise it. So this is typically the very experiential immersive moment. And then they evaluate or reflect on their use of that learning outcome uh, in, in that specific context. What we add to this is also recontextualizing. So exploring this same concept in a variety of different contexts uh, and that is uh, really where the, the magic comes through with experiential learning, that you learn something in one way and see how it applies across a variety of different situations. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, this connects to our, our broader vision and hope for, for learning. Um, you know, most, most of us are not here yet, but this is where we hope to go, which is, uh, you know, this integration, true integration of experiential learning across the entire university. So using a backbone of skills that is a common language across academics, student affairs, career services, et cetera, that really enrich and build the scaffolding to integrate experience uh, throughout the university. Um, so those are little tidbits from, from the white paper uh, that I just want to pull in to, to define here as well. Thank you, Megan, for sharing this. That's very, very helpful to context set. And I want to make sure we just really clearly say why this is important. I suspect we're preaching to the choir, but we kind of went through the what it is. Kate, what does it get people? Why is this so important at MIT? I think it's it's learning that is is often kind of what our students point back to five years out, 10 years out and say, that was the experience that was the most transformative in my MIT experience, right? Like, like during my four years as an undergraduate at MIT, that was what made the difference. That's what really set me on the path or that's what, what diverted me from a path that I thought I wanted to be on and, and found that I quite did not want to be on it. So I think it, it really, it, in addition to the skill building and the learning, I think it allows students to test drive professional identities and their personal values and their preferences in a slightly lower risk environment than once they've graduated. Um, and, and you don't get that in the classroom in the same way. Capri, same question to you. I think these are all really important things that we are trying to work in, that sense of importance and agency and taking ownership of your academic journey and knowing that that's not just inside the classroom. Why is it that we want to do this for partner universities? Hmm. Well, the why I think really gets to the purpose of education, right? I, the way that education is currently structured does not meet the needs of the complexity and vast change that's happening in the world right now. And so, you know, preparing students to know who they are and operate successfully in the world requires them to gain a lot more experience than just you know studying and memorizing information for a test. I think it's really about gaining experience to know who they are and operate effectively in the world today. Um, and but the 
that's easy to say. And I think a lot of our work with partners is getting into the, the really details and the, the grit of what that means. Because we're also really talking about institutional transformation, uh, which is not easy to do and really helping people change their mindsets and their behaviors uh, as part of this broader meeting of the moment of what is needed in the world today from education. Yeah, I think the definition I really resonate with for the purpose of education is preparing people to thrive in the world they'll inherit, right? How do we create experiences that are going to help people see what their purpose is, what their education is for, how they can give back and contribute? And I know based on my own classroom teaching is I, I had never thought about those things. I know that it's important for them to know the content knowledge. I think that I'm teaching them critical thinking skills, but I had never had this sort of broader perspective on the university system as a whole and how we can come in and give students not just classroom experiences from one individual faculty member, but really think about the system of what's happening outside of the classroom, what's happening inside of the classroom, how learning outcomes are connected. So if we could define sort of an ideal world for experiential learning, what is the platonic ideal? And maybe Capri, I'll go to you first and then we'll bounce it back over to Kate. Sure, um, the ideal in experiential learning uh, as I see it and as we build it at Minerva Project is intentionally designed experiences around specific learning outcomes that are defined ahead of time and communicated clearly to students. Um, and it's active. You know, a lot of experiential learning, people think, oh, we took them on a field trip to a river and now we're done. Uh, but rather it's about, you know, that's effectively a lecture in a way of, you know, you've gone, you've been spoken to, and then you go back to the classroom. But what we're talking about in terms of the ideal is really I understand the purpose of this experience. I understand the skills that I'm in practicing through this experience. And then I get to really immerse in it and explore uh, and then connect it back to what I'm learning in the classroom. So uh, really the, the high level answer is an intentionally designed experience around specific learning outcomes that is in an active learning manner. And Kate, I saw you sort of light up when you said it's not just a field trip to the river. Can yes, you tell us a yes. little bit more about how we can take that field trip to the river and maybe make it more of the ideal version of experiential learning? Yeah, I think it goes back to, you know, the the need for it to be rigorous, connected to the academic um, enterprise, right? Like what you're studying in your major, why, like why you're at university. Um, but but the dosage really matters. So I used to be the director of the public service center here at MIT. And uh, and we had a program that was basically a day of service when I arrived. So, you know, students would go and they would volunteer for an afternoon at the food bank. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't consider that experiential learning. Like it's, it's not rigorous. You're putting cans into boxes on trucks. Um, it is an afternoon. The dosage isn't long enough to, to really make a major contribution or to learn anything. So I so I think those sort of field trip things can be really, I think, instrumental as a as an introductory experience. But I think what what Capri and I are talking about is like a much more immersive, intensive, and intentional um, experience that that honestly is like that I would say the existing academic infrastructure at most universities is not designed to accommodate. So that's that's sort of a challenge in terms of like how how do you do that? Um, and and I think it takes some some intentionality around the systems and the structures to support it um, because they don't necessarily exist in in that sense right now. Yeah, I think one of the beautiful things about that example is that it's certainly not what the ideal situation is, but it could be, right? It could be a class about food systems, and it could be a class about individual agencies working in a community to solve problems, but exactly. oftentimes it's considered this one-off. Yeah, exactly. And I think at MIT, one of the things we discovered um, with the Public Service Center was our students were not particularly interested in the garden variety public service volunteering at food banks and, and K-12 schools. Um, unless there was a tech component, right? Like if that food bank needed a, a sort of data system overhaul or needed, you know, someone to take a look at how their client, you know, security 
infrastructure was was set up or to use AI in some form or fashion, our students were all in. They were like, yes, just let us code. Um, we're happy to do it for a nonprofit. We're happy to do it for Google. And so so thinking about like ways that that students can contribute with the talents and the skills that they they bring to organizations that maybe typically use volunteers in a very different capacity, um, I think is is sort of what we're talking about, where we're thinking about like, how do you make that match between the students that you have and their interests and their career aspirations and the needs in the community or, or opportunities out um, in the world? I think I just, with that, yeah, go ahead, Capri. I wanna quickly add to that too, because it just feels like such a big missed opportunity that you know, the role of universities contributing to society, right? Like so much of, of university is behind this closed wall versus, you know, what are ways that we can really integrate education in the locations where students are and even beyond. And I think the type of learning that Kate just described, you know, really talks about this potential for way more contribution of the university to society and through a really enriched student experience that's giving back and giving them direct moments of application for what they're learning. Hubbard, it sounds like it's really about making it both student-centric and institution-specific in service of the community that they live in. So do you have an example of a really great experiential learning experience, for lack of a better word, a learning journey that would take this approach? Hmm. Yes, let me think from one of our partners. Um, well, I mean, it's there's many examples from Minerva University. Um, and I think that's where, you know, we were able to design from scratch and create that uh, connection between uh, the city as a campus, as we viewed it, and, um, you know, the curriculum. Um, however, I want to pull from one of our current partners. Um, and so I'll think about like University of Miami, they, they've launched um, this uh, innovation technology and design program. And a core part of the, the design of that program is a similar view of the city as a place for rich learning opportunities. And so uh, as a core part of the curriculum, students have design challenges where they are partnered with an organization that has a specific design challenge that students address over the course of the semester. Um, to really apply the design thinking skills that they're learning directly to uh, a project that's in need in the community. Um, and so they partnered uh, in the first year with this organization called The Underline, which is a, a civic organization that uh, designs the spaces under the metro rail in Miami. And students designed and implemented projects with The Underline, um, you know, and got to see the direct impact of, of the work that they, that they created through you know, water catchment systems and immersive art experiences to connect with the public. Um, and so I think a lot of universities are starting to do more things like this. And I think that's really encouraging for the direction of experiential learning to see these directly applied projects. I would just jump in and add, I think um, it's important not to think about communities, particularly local communities around universities as just kind of repositories of need. Um, but I think there's a lot of expertise that resides in those communities and knowledge that resides in those communities and figuring out like, how do you respectfully, reciprocally like engage those experts um, as part of the educational journey of our students. And, and I think that's something that, um, again, higher ed isn't great at in terms of like, like we understand this is a tenured professor, this is a, you know, an instructor, this is a staff person, but I think figuring out mechanisms to bring in that that um, expertise, those connections, um, and engage with with practitioners locally or around the world, and to sort of recognize and reward that practical knowledge and that non academic expertise um, is really is really important. Yeah, I think one of the the things that's a little bit stressful from a faculty perspective is like, oh, I own the curriculum, like it's mine, and I have my domain inside of my classroom, and asking people to broaden their minds a bit and say, how can you make those walls dissolve, not just between where people learn, but what they learn and who they learn it from is really important. One place where I can still have a sense of control as a faculty member is perhaps in the learning outcomes and the feedback, right? I become the curator of the knowledge. So Capri, I want to speak a little bit about the rigor of 
what it means to include learning outcomes and how they might be assessed. Yes. Um, so in terms of the learning outcomes, more what we push for is more than just defining learning outcomes for a specific course, uh, actually defining the learning outcomes for a broader program. So, um, you know, students across courses will be using similar durable skills that will be transferable across different contexts and having alignment across faculty, which can be very challenging, I know, um, on a kind of shared set of learning outcomes that students get to apply in different contexts. Um, but really defining those durable skills, sharing them across contexts, and then having students um, you know, in a specific activity, an experiential activity being connected directly to that learning outcome. So it's not just, oh, we should do more experiential learning and have this experience or this project, but it's really, what do we want students to learn Let's define those skills and then let's design the experiences around that. And, and I'll say, I think Minerva is kind of best in class and in, in thinking about creating structures that that are explicit about learning outcomes and connect those to what you're actually doing. Um, at MIT, we have a very wide range of um, of sort of levels of sophistication in our experiential learning programs in terms of do they even have learning outcomes? Are they kind of well-crafted? Are they accessible? Do, do the programs have the capacity on staff to, to actually measure um, what, they, what they say they're trying to do? And, and often, I think, outside of the classroom, where these are opportunities that students are going to Nepal or the Netherlands or Nebraska over the summer to do, like you don't, like the students aren't necessarily in your field of vision while they're doing the thing which makes it even a little bit harder. So um, so I think this has been a huge uh, challenge for us at MIT. And it's very, it's very different for programs, but also for faculty. It's not, it's not grading a PSET or an exam or a research paper, um, but it's also not impossible. I think our teaching and learning center here at MIT has been a fantastic resource. And this has been one thing that we've really been um, working a lot with our experiential learning programs here on. Yeah, that's really wonderful to see sort of how it can come from the bottom up or how it can come top down from a more institutional perspective about how we're going to organize people and what are the rules of engagement for people who want to bring this to life across an institution. And, and I'm going to say, I know the answer to the question I'm about to ask, which is the answer is both. But when you think about top down approaches versus bottom up, Maybe, Kate, it sounds like in your community garden landscape architecture metaphor, it's very organic. And I think you have a, a background in grassroots organization. So tell us a little bit about how you brought that to life at MIT in support of that bottom-up approach. Yeah, uh, the pandemic was wildly helpful, I'll say, um, which is kind of a weird thing to say. Uh, I think one of the most important things that we did at, at MIT was to build a community of practice. We had a a whole bunch of programs from our undergraduate research um, program that 93% of students participate in to uh, innovation entrepreneurship programs, public service, but they were all like in their own box and in their own silos. And so they didn't think of themselves as experiential learning and students didn't think of themselves as participating in experiential learning when they were going off and doing these things and they still may not. Um, but but during the pandemic, we started convening all of these programs on on almost a weekly basis at one point. And this was this was sort of like we needed to tell them about changes to our travel policy or building access or other things that were kind of changing on a minute by minute basis. Um, but we got everybody together and that group has endured beyond the pandemic. To call, we call it our EL plus uh, group. And we get together monthly and now we're focused on things like learning outcomes and assessment and we bring in the teaching and learning lab. Um, to do workshops with us. We have presentations from senior MIT leaders on institute priorities, like um, we have a big climate project that, that was just announced. They're sharing best practices with each other. So it's it's hugely important. They're a hugely important group of allies and thought partners. Um, and it's it's been a real boon to have them think about themselves as a group, as sort of a, a community. Um, and so I'll say, uh, if you have kind of a similarly disorganized but but game group on your campus, um, buy them sandwiches once a month or once a quarter. It's the best money you'll spend um, to sort of create that sense of goodwill and a sense of connection and common purpose. And you really kind of th 
throw a sheet over the ghost of all of the stuff that's happening and make it feel like it's it's maybe a little bit more intentional and cohesive. I'll sometimes tell students that survival of the fittest for humans was survival of the groupiest. And so if yeah. you can create that sense of community, that's going to be a really powerful lever for going with this bottom-up approach, identifying the champions and supporting them and connecting them to each other. Kapri, what about the alternative, that sort of top-down approach? In terms of how, how to go about doing the top-down approach? How to go about it, why it's important. It's a very unspecific question. Thank you for calling me out on it. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, so I think from the top down, uh, the key is really having leadership buy-in. So leader, and, and that's often the work that we do is, you know, leaders of institutions come to us and they say, hey, like, I'm wanting to make a change. I want to have more experiential learning in this program. How do we go about that? And so I think having the leadership buy-in, the leadership uh, alignment with this way of teaching and, and integrating more experience is essential. Um, and then it's really about inspiring the change within the organization. So I fully agree with Kate, uh, what you just said about, you know, convening the people, but also doing that from a leadership perspective. So communicating why this is important and then That's empowering important. people yeah. with the resources and the incentives to, you know, include more experiential learning, to have more budgets or, you know, faculty buyouts to be able to, to really do this uh, and, and just start creating. And, and I think, having a central place that is thinking about the infrastructure. Again, I think the existing academic infrastructure, a lot of the experiential learning um, at MIT is curricular, but a lot of it is, is not. Um, and the existing academic apparatus isn't really designed for experiential learning. So there's no registrar. It's sort of organized differently on every campus, not always officially recognized or tracked or integrated into degree pathways or measured neatly into credit units. And often it's kind of thought of as like a nice to have and funded on soft money, um, driven by student initiative, but but kind of hard to navigate. So there's like connective tissue that's missing. Um, and the programs that are actually offering the experiential learning don't have the time or the perch and position to really be kind of seeing where there's opportunity to, to build that connective tissue that feels like that feels supportive as opposed to like additional bureaucracy and stuff that they have to do that they don't have time to do. Yes. And that's why like the creation of, of your office and team, Kate, that you're overseeing all of these disparate parts is like so essential. And it's kind of part of this broader trend that we're seeing as well of like chief experience officer positions or, you know, offices of experiential learning being created. I think that really creates the, that some of that connective tissue to begin pulling the pieces together. Yeah, I think one interesting thing about combining these approaches is that they're reinforcing, right? You need buy-in from leadership and you can either have that go to supporting resources that are going to do things from the ground up, or it can go to sort of setting the stage and then letting people self-organize. University of Miami has an interesting approach here where they named innovation fellows for the ITD program that Capri mentioned before. And what that lets you do is give people that sense of community and belonging without them having to put their hand up, which has that added benefit of sort of being chosen and having that be part of someone's identity. And then they can be these champions to the rest of the institution about how they're going to share the best practices that they've learned. Yeah, it also gives people a bit of an excuse to be instigators of change. You know, it's like, oh, I'm an innovation fellow. This is my designated role to disrupt and to do things differently. And I think designating disruptors within the organization is another important kind of top-down strategy that can be be really effective. And, and I, I'll just add, I think that particularly now in an era of, of flex work and remote work, like people are just hungry for connection. Um, and so I think they are uh, generally delighted when you host a picnic or you have a lunch or you have some opportunity where people can kind of get together and share what they're talking about. They're not a lot of those moments, I think, um, for kind of reflection and sharing uh, as, as many as folks would like. Yeah. And when it becomes virtual or a little bit more hybrid, 
it becomes more intentional, not to go back to our buzzword of this conversation, but you're really telling people why they're there. So many things I think that happen in education happen because people have bumped into each other, whether that's two research people who are now going to collaborate or me running into a student at a cafeteria or students finding a mentor in the library. Like all of these things happen, but they happen ad hoc in a lot of ways. And so when we're intentional about the design of student experience, we can really cultivate these relationships so students don't fall through the cracks on them. One thing that I wanna make sure we get to, although we have touched on it a couple of times, is not just what the challenges are, but how we can start facing them. So it sounds like we've covered resources, we've covered change management and buy-in, covered this sense that experiential learning is fluffy. If you had to pick the biggest challenge and how you might go about addressing it, you're both making very thoughtful faces, so I don't know who to ask first. <laughs> Kate, go ahead. I I think for us, the, the biggest challenge at MIT is um, it's kind of making the market function. I mean, that's like, that's a very expansive way to define the problem. So I'm, I'm bundling a lot uh, underneath that. Just but break think, it down. <laughs> yeah, but we have, so, so we have consumers of experiences, which are the students, right? The learners. And we have producers of experience um, who are some of our programs or faculty or external organizations that we partner with. And, um, and our students are, are very busy and they overload and then they overcommit. Um, and it's very difficult to get them sort of good, complete, just-in-time information about what their options are um, and to kind of give them it, the advising to help them make the best choice for them and not just sort of gravitate to the, the most popular um, you know, or the, the, the program that has the best posters or that pays the, the highest stipend. And so I think, I think figuring out like, how do you improve the, the quality and quantity and digestibility of information that students get um, and the advising to help them sift through that information. And then, and then really working with the experience providers to make sure that those experiences are as high quality and on point as they possibly can be. And like, you need that, you need somebody who's gonna play that role as a market maker. And that takes money, that takes staff capacity, that takes sandwiches, right? Like, and it, and it takes sort of some credibility, I think with, with both sides to be able to build the things that you need to build. But I think that's, that's what we really wrestle with is just, you know, too much information, not enough information, the wrong information. Um, and then, and then making sure that the experiences that students do sort of opt to participate in are, are as good as they can be. Papri, this is reminding me of our trip to Fresno. And I think this is a challenge a lot of universities face is that they have so many services, but the matching marketplace, as Kate put it, is hard to navigate through. So if we take that as an important challenge, how have we worked with people to overcome that? Yeah, so the, the example of Fresno, um, we worked with them to start not from the academic side like we typically do or, or have frequently done, um, but starting from the student life side, um, they came to us with an interest in creating a set of learning outcomes from the student uh, affairs, student experience side, and then using that to bridge into more connection to academics. Um, and really, when we worked with them, one of the most valuable and impactful things was helping them to break down the silos of their team. Um, so much of the university structure is siloed and separate. And so uh, similar to the sandwich approach, you know, just bringing everyone together into one room and again, reconnecting them to the purpose of why they are educators, what they are here for. It's so easy to get lost in all of the committees and the bureaucracy and trying to do everything at once, really just being a bit more essentialist and coming back to like, what are we really here for? And let's focus on that um, and connect through that um, was just kind of taking a moment of pause and connecting people was actually quite powerful. Um, so again, about this kind of culture building and connection, it is a movement in a way of what we're trying to create here of a movement and a change towards experiential learning and, and having more of that as part of a broader view of the student experience, right? So 
so much of our current approach to offering education is from these silos and from a faculty or staff perspective versus what if we all stopped and paused and looked at the student journey? What is the student going through and how do we reorient with a student centric approach? Um, so I think really working with teams to reorient their focus, recenter on their purpose can be really helpful for changing mindsets, which then hopefully over time, then change the system and the ways of working as well. I would just add to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Christine. You. Um, I would add two other things that that universities can do to, to sort of, I don't know, jumpstart this or or kind of think about ways to, to, to get started. Um, one, one that's really important at MIT is to kind of create space. And I mean that like literally and figuratively for, for students to do stuff, right? With their hands. <laughs> so we have, we have some maker spaces and we have one in particular that, that I always think of, which is a, a garage um, with our Edgerton Center where students build, you know, a solar electric vehicle. They build a Formula One race car. They're building all kinds of stuff and half of it I probably don't want to know about because it would uh, keep me up at night. But it's not used for classes. So like it is just for students and it gives them the space and the tools and the equipment to go in and tinker. And um, and that is, that's very, like there are lots of those um, spaces on campus. We actually have a nuclear maker space, which does keep me up at night sometimes because I think that concept is a little uh, terrifying. Although the faculty member in charge is is, is very responsible and, and careful. But thinking about not just physical space, but, but funding for opportunities for students to go work with, you know, nonprofits or government agencies that can't pay where you can sort of underwrite those experiences, building connections to alumni, to employers, to practitioners, super important. So, so figuring out ways to kind of let student initiative flourish, I think is super important. And then, um, and then baking opportunities into what is sort of the core mission of the university. So our undergraduate research opportunities program or Europe really taps the the research side of MIT's mission and and gets undergraduates directly into faculty members labs and they're working alongside professors and research scientists and postdocs and grad students and 50% of our faculty participate and 93% of our undergrads do a year off before they graduate and so it is just like it is baked into again the DNA of MIT um, in a way that I think feels seamless because there's so much research going on around here. And Europe is the undergrad research program, right? That's the experiences that people are yes. with a faculty member or something like that? Yeah, exactly. I want to challenge both of you to give a piece of advice to me as a college president who might not have as many resources as some of the partners we've mentioned so far. I think that experiential learning is just the way your brain learns, but we don't want to make sure that that's concentrated in places that are already privileged. So if you had to give a piece of advice... What can you do on Monday differently with this information if I've had like a week to think about how to do it and I don't have a large grant and I don't have this standing in the community where people just want to take my students? Capri, I'll let you go first. Yeah, well, something that Kate and I have talked about a lot is just how many opportunities already exist on campuses. And so there's this feeling that we need to create something new and there's all of this structure and momentum that needs to be made when actually there's a rich student life, uh, student initiatives and student club ecosystem, there's sports, there's all of these moments that are already happening on campuses that are these kind of untapped potential for really rich experiential learning. So if on Monday you needed to start doing something, I think it would be looking at what already exists on your campus and how can you connect through some explicitly defined learning outcomes, connect those experiences to each other and part of a broader, more intentional student experience um, around learning outcomes. So that that is what I would say for an immediate thing is just so many untapped potential for learning in what is already happening on campus. It just needs to be connected more intentionally to a broader program for learning. Can I push you back a little bit to say, oh, yeah. what's a specific example of doing that? Because in theory, it's like connect the people and that's great. But so imagine I'm teaching a psychology class and I want to do something more experiential. What do I, who do I talk to on student life? What do I do? 
Great. Yes. Yeah. So most campuses have either a co-curricular team or a student life team or a student activities committee that's organizing experiences for students. So psychology is so broadly applicable to so many different things. Um, you could look at um, even in like, I don't know, game theory and sci like the psychology of, of human behavior um, with sports and, you know, so connecting with someone on the student life team to have students, you know, as they're playing, thinking about, you know, how they're applying specific skills um, or biases, you know, thinking about all the different contexts where biases may be in uh, model UN student debate that students can be, you know, thinking about specific learning outcomes and around biases that connect to a course in psychology. So, you know, if, if in your course, you're looking at your semester, you see there's a model UN competition on campus in October, you know, organize your syllabus around having students engage with what's already happening on campus and connect it to specific learning outcomes um, as the students go and then bring their reflections back into, cl into class after they've had the experience. That's yeah, like what I love about that is I don't actually have to rewrite my syllabus for that. I can see all of these opportunities. And that's part of our work is to work with faculty to say, if you have a good class, you are already teaching these skills. It's just a matter of helping students see where they might connect those skills to the experiences they're having outside of the classroom. I want to get to questions, but Kate, I also want to give you the opportunity to say like, best piece of advice, where do you get started? Yeah, I, I would second everything that Cabri said. Uh, I think, I think looking, taking stock of what's already happening on your campus and, um, and growing what you've got. So I think like I always talk about throwing the sheet over the ghost, there's stuff happening, but we don't sort of see it. And so you need to make it more visible to students. And that might be adding a kind of designation in, in the course catalog. It might be creating kind of a, an online, you know, registry or inventory of opportunities. I think that that's one is sort of the visibility to students. I think there are opportunities, low cost, um, easy to implement ways to amplify the learning that happens when students are participating in experiential learning by adding kind of a curricular wrapper course that focuses on some uh, aspect like ethics or sustainability, um, where you can really kind of um, uh, kind of add the nutritional value of <laughs> add to the nutritional value of the experience. And then the last piece is, is align your advising, make sure that that your academic advisors are also taking this um, this aspect of their of the educational opportunities into account when they're talking to students about planning their their four years or their educational trajectory. I think we've come full circle to the idea that this is all really holistic, right? You need that bottom up support, you need the top down support, but it's really about making sure the university operates as a collective rather than a bunch of independent operators. <laughs> say like faculty are actually kind of in the gig economy. They're all sort of doing what they want. And I think we could say that about a lot of teams. They're all operating in silos that students don't see unless we create them for them because they're just having a continuous experience. There are some great suggestions in chat. We're actually going to stop the recording now. So I hope people who are typing things that are either questions or contributions will pop on their cameras, raise their hand and ask us some of your most pressing questions. <laughs> <laughs>